So good evening and welcome to the first potent residence readings of the semester. As many of you know, I'm Lauren Elaine. I'm an assistant professor in the English department and I'm also the potent residence here at the University of Dubuque. Um, I am really excited tonight, not because I had to wheel out more chairs, that's, that's exciting too, but tonight is, uh, this marks the beginning of the fifth year of the series, can you believe it? It's been going on for that long. And since 2010, I've been really excited. We've brought over 20 writers to UD, including Roxane Gay, who, whose book is on the best, New York Times bestseller list right now, um, Patricia Smith, who just received a Guggenheim Award, Mary Swander, who's a poet laureate of Iowa. So we've had, and of course, our own George Eklund, who's with us tonight. So we've had some really wonderful people come through the program over the last five years, four years into five. And the goal of the series is, is simple and it's not so simple. Um, of course, we want to bring these wonderful diverse writers to our campus. We want them to meet you, our wonderful students, uh, see our lovely city of Dubuque. Um, but I have a secret second goal, which is I really want to create or facilitate the opportunity for encounters in language. And what I mean by that is that reading if and when we do read is often a solitary act. Again, it's you know sort of between the text and the reader, and the author is you know sort of away, separated by time and space and circumstance. And what a live reading can offer is this other dimension where the writer is able literally to give voice to his or her what I like to call the internal landscape, right? Which is what we find in in poetry and text, all the imaginative work. Um, the thought experiments in language that we see in books, in text. And so that solitary reading experience becomes something that's shared and that's communal. The writer is real to us and we are to her or to him. And you know, I really believe that's a potent exchange. It's something that's opening. It doesn't mean you're going to immediately understand and process everything you hear immediately, but it's an opportunity if you are open to it that it will open you as well. And so I'm so excited to offer our students and the debut community um, this opportunity here at UD. And tonight in particular, I'm thrilled to welcome poet and UD alum, George Eklund. Um, George graduated from the University of Dubuque in 1974. Um, he earned his teaching credentials here and taught in back east and then back here in Dubuque um, before going on to get his MFA from the University of Iowa Writers Workshop, which is still even today uh, so often known as the best writing workshop in the country. Um, he's currently a professor of English at Moorhead State University in Kentucky, and he's been there for 26 years. He's published work in several prominent journals. I'm not going to give you a laundry list. Um, and is the author of four collections of poetry, which are for sale at the back of the room after the reading. And he's going to be happy to sign them, too. Um, and I'm just, you know, having read uh, this work, I wasn't familiar with George's work before. He was introduced to me by his friend, Rosalind, uh, several friends from here at UD. And here's my take. Eklund's work is truly lyric attending to the contemplative, the philosophical. He wrestles with what it means to be a living being with sentiments, you know, this line I picked from, I don't know the shape of what I've lost. I don't know the shape of my gift. I don't completely know the nature of my materials, which is in Art of the Essay number four. He imagines under what conditions the status of living might change and um, my class some had some experience with that today. We read the poem, Dying in the Kitchen, where he says, I think collapsing in the kitchen would be a fine way to go. Life is small, he says, and the confusion immense. And I think that's a sentiment we can all relate to. There are questions that have no easy answers in the poems. Is there anything, he asks, that will never leave us? And there are revelations both startling and profound, my favorite being, Words exist to keep us from killing ourselves. The poems, most of all, are lyric movements of a mind reaching both into itself and outward into the world in search of connection, the very act that makes us both human and divine. Eklund reminds us in a poem I forgot to put the title of, God hums through our bones, through us and to each other. Please join me in welcoming back to UD, George Eklund.
Lauren, thank you for that lovely uh, introduction. I'd like a copy of that essay. I thought it was so smart, much smarter than my poems, I fear. This is a dream for me, and it's uh, alive and real, and I want to thank Lauren and John Bars and Lynn Trierweiler and Rob Gamal, who are all on the faculty, for helping to make this happen. I'd also like to thank my spouse, Laura Eklund, who makes all good things happen in my life, got me here in one piece and sustains me. It's been uh, 10 or 11 years since I've been back in town. The last time I was here was a very quick uh, visit. Uh, a good friend of mine had passed and I wanted to be here for the funeral. So imagine my surprise. Uh, coming back to this campus and this town with all that's taken place. Uh, I'm just stunned and I'm so happy for you all for what's happening on this campus and in this community and in the town. Dubuque is a place I've always loved because it was so good to me. It nurtured me and helped me grow up and learn and expand. And to see a place that I love prosper as it has is a deep, a profound joy. I'm so very happy for all of you. It's not just the facades. It's not just the, the grand designs and buildings. It's what's still alive here uh, in the hearts of uh, the people who live in this river valley. It's palpable. And I, uh, I share your blessings. I just have to say I love the way this town and this campus have preserved what's old as they've progressed into what is new. And I saw ample proof of it downtown and around campus today. The cathedral is here, of course, we expect that. But a museum of art downtown? <laughs> Along with miracle car wash, it's still there. Paul's Tavern with the animal trophies hanging on the wall. I saw it as soon as I drove into town, how miraculous. But perhaps the biggest surprise of all, Murph's Southside Tavern turned into a tourist destination. There's a little green sign on Bluff Street that says Murph's Tavern is this way. I thought, how, how amazing. Back uh, 30 years ago, we, we found our way there quite easily. It was getting our way out of it that we, we had trouble with. But there's, uh, it's a, a grand time to come home, and thank you all for being here tonight. I'd like to read a few pieces from each one of my books. And I'd like to start with a book that was published here in Dubuque in 1982 by Stephen Shepard, who was a, an innovative uh, pioneer in uh, small press and publishing here in Dubuque. Uh, he was very good to me, and he published this book called Gone West of Sunrise Highway. You can still buy it on the internet, but it's, it's costly. It's become a collector's item, but I'm sure there are ways to pirate these poems. <laughs> Go ahead and do it. You know. The ticks. In the morning heat, we yanked the ticks off old Skip, at times from each other's necks and scalps. Me and my brothers showed them off to each other, horrible blood gems held up into the morning glint, their little demon heads still wedged in a piece of skin we'd lost. The fat ones you hated most. That was our blood, old Skip's blood sucked out of us, robbed, sealed away. Tom liked best to light them with a match. John and Jimmy set them adrift down Amazon puddles. Old Skip just didn't give a damn whether they screamed or not. But me and my hammer, hot damn, how we yelled laughter when our blood was set free. And you could see our blood was still blood and not turned to some animal pus. 
a purple stain darkened the stoop and stayed all summer. Excuse me. Yeah, a lot of these poems were written in Dubuque or close to Dubuque, and uh, I think the imagery and the spirit and the voice and the stories uh, remind me of, of my time here. A lot of these poems in this book are narrative and uh, kind of easy to grasp if you get into the story and follow them and stay with them. It's like little videos. As we move through my work, I kind of move away from that aesthetic. But I hope you'll uh, hang on tight for the ride. That boy in winter or rain, a big family in a small house. If you wanted to wonder or cry in private, you ran for the woods where the wind caught fire in your hair, but in winter or rain, there was only the bathroom door that would lock. And within a minute at most, a rattling complaint or a whine or a little scream would set you running for a last chance in the attic. It didn't take long to know the world was also a nut house. I'd thumb stacks of magazines, if not circus dogs doing cute human things or Alan Shepard, some of you know who he was. A jubilant wreck fresh from space, you'd hit the desecrated Pieta, or starving Biafran children, sticks in the dust. Now it's a large quiet in my small house, though the hours alone are often a joy. I'm still a boy in winter or rain when I read the magazines. Poet listens for voices, and I certainly had access to a rich, symphonic range of voices in my, my years here. Here are two of them. A poem called Saturday Dusk, kind of in two voices. Maybe you've heard them, too. Huge women headed for the parking ramp, shopping bag ballast in each arm, pink tickets in their hands, talking, who shot out the made right window? Talking it over and over. And the kids got the prom tonight, and Mary Ellen, she's got bingo. And the rain, they say on the radio, it's polluted like everything comes down, comes down, and be a shame if it rains on the kids tonight. They got that party out at Mud Lake. No, never been a foreign army come here. No, never will be. If it comes, gonna come from up topside, see? They say first you go blind, then hot wind like a hundred twisters. I've seen pictures. Like a man got no hands and one big blister for a brain and pop, boy, tears his pus. Play the nine ball, split off the three. Next round's on me. Then you best get home and get dressed. Here are two other characters you might have met. You might even be related to Vince or Joe. It's called Vince and Joe. Two men walking an Iowa field, rifles lazy in their arms as if someone said, here, carry these for me. The dog skittish and confused, not a bird all day. Vince and Joe, two miles above Germany, 1945, lost cherries in London, came back all quiet, turned a lathe, turned the earth, turned in their sleep, years the dreams of flack. That was their planet when I was just a dream, but they said I'd have my turn. Beer and spades at the kitchen table, sun dripping off the windows, not a bird all day. These poems are 30 years old. 
I looked through the book looking for ones I still liked, and I found a few. So that's pretty good to find a few that have aged pretty well. It says something about language. I wonder if they'll be good in another 30 years. We shall see. Uh, Here's one more uh, piece from this collection. This piece has Dubuque all over it. Uh, once upon a time, there was a packing house here. Some of you remember it. And a lot of culture and life and stuff revolved around that world. And I found it uh, a very compelling kind of metaphor and symbol for uh, our country, for America. This is called The Bloody Harvest. Past widows gathering front porch papers, past rows of amputated oaks, gears growling to a roar above the hot rubber hum of the motor cowboys, factory bound in five minutes, a trailer load of raving pigs glides down to the stacks at the river. Lord, loud they shriek and wail for some god of hoof and tail to suck away the smell of their butchered brethren. An ooze of purple factory smoke caulks the leak of dawn above the Mississippi. At 1 a.m., lined up, swine-shouldered with my own kind at the ten-pin tap, we bow our heads at the trough where pain goes away. Some wait for courage. There is none. Some for redemption. There is none. It's just that pain goes away. As we sway, bug-eyed against the urinals by Christ, widows will leaf the obituaries. Thick-knuckled men will pull down 20 thou cutting peckers and pea bags. My country, born of a bloody harvest, will have its meat, will exhale the colors of all its casualties, steaming into the dawn of the hot industrial earth. Thank you, Dubuque, for that poem and for all those poems. They couldn't have been written any other way. I, I wonder if they could have been written in any other town or any other place. It's a joy to, uh, to re it's a kind of a scary joy to revisit them. Thank you all for your, your good eyes. Let me move on to um, a book of mine called Each Breath I Cannot Hold. Sometimes I wonder if I've been writing the same poems over and over again. Maybe as you hear them tonight, you'll hear motifs or, or patterns in the images and the pictures, the sounds, the dramas. See what happens. I think those four boys from the ticks keep showing up uh, in, in my work. Uh, they might be here a little bit in a poem called uh, Essay on Four Boys. The day is long, but it cannot contain us. I am bound to creation by the veins that know nothing. Little boys once played on that stone wall, and I held their hands. In a chemical, I let myself hold them. I had my time. I had more than I deserved. I get sick talking with myself. Too bad I couldn't become a stone when I die. Plucked by a young boy's hand from the system of a clear stream every bridge in town rattling through a dream. The body has a religious need for silence, as if the mind could not be filthy in it. Four boys climbed a tree that held them all as long as the day. They fell one by one in the asthma of contrition. To speak of it is to eat your way out of a membrane, a burning bone held in each hand, a vein hanging from the mouth a vapor inhaled by a machine or a cow, hard faces now at their rowing through the filaments of our names. You learn a lot by reading your work and going through it and sharing it with people. I can't believe how obsessive I am with certain things, like death, for instance. I, it shows up all the time. I'm sorry. <laughs> I try not to be completely humorless about it, though. This piece is called uh, Essay on Dying and Not Dying. 
In a swath of evening, always a tremor comes in the conversation. I don't want to move from this window, cracked and patched with tape. Let's wait for one more layer of darkness. Tell me about the prize you won as a child, or how you wanted to be chosen. I will be changing form soon, but not into the ghost of a song that praised soldiers. Must I believe in what I say? Words exist to keep us from killing ourselves. I want to breathe until there is only one question left. Tell me something senseless I might carry into the not work of a dream. Something pointless and divine. Abandoned rails covered in windy grass. Life is small, the confusion is immense. The day is short. The mind creates itself beyond the sun where I am just a word, the eternity of a word again. A lot of these recent poems reflect the landscape I live in now, which is in eastern Kentucky. It's very hilly, a lot of gravel roads, a lot of trees. It's very beautiful. I live by a gravel road, and I walk on it, and that's where this poem started. I have uh, fields on one side of the gravel road, and they're, they're quite beautiful. Not as big as Iowa fields, or Illinois, or Indiana fields. On the drive up here, I was just struck by the, the gorgeous landscape of the Midwest once again. But for now, I invite you back on this gravel road. It's called Composition in a Snowfield. The face bleeds and it disappears. I close my eyes in a snowstorm. The blade is imaginary. The blood is real. I want to lie down. I can't remember. The deer pass through the ghosts of the garden and into a vein of voices. Lights are fading along the highway. Now this is a territory cleared of guns and broken glass. A pot of water boils in the past. Those were my Easter eggs. I hold them in an apron now, years of them now, beneath the trees that stick to the sky. The cranial nerves are cut from their tears, and the snow and the field are one. Whoever cried is dying in the hands that slipped away. I want to lie down in the storm, clutching my ladder of bones. Above me, the cows driven home to Jesus Christ, past the branches of the captives hanging there. Now I am picked up and out of my red rubber boots. I have wet myself and I drink tea, brewed from white flowers, pulled from the dark holes of the head. I think of nakedness and the dream I had of large meals by the sea, yellow school buses lined up in the rain, a faceless God touching me with my own hands, white sails made of milk and snow. That story is a little harder to follow now, isn't it? <laughs> what was going on with that guy? I, I really liked Lauren's uh, invitation to all of us to engage in language at this level and maybe give ourselves permission to say, well, I didn't quite get it, but that's okay because there were moments there where I felt fully charged or involved or felt as if I had been taken to a, a walk down a gravel road while the field was being covered with snow. Is that okay? Oh yes, I think so, yeah. yeah. Huh. Are you ready for a love poem? Let's do it, okay, yeah. How do you write a love poem? Uh, in the year 2014, it's a challenge, isn't it? Um, you got Shakespeare breathing over your, over your neck, you know? Uh, so you go to a room where you were painting the room, and maybe that's where the love poem might start. This is called This Green Room. Into the room we painted green, we admired the silence of the other. I loved the way you walked, your bare feet, and your constant recovery. What gets painted, painted is beautiful, and it's changing, because it disappears 
in order to be made. Perhaps we could illumine a small town, small lives this way, seeing in an absence of green a diagram of the sonorous. We had to be seen. Bride, you would be green with me. Six o'clock nerves be done. We could not stop looking at each other. What should we hang on those walls? Good way to find out if you look, you know, how the relationship is going. Paint a room with them, right? Do a project. Where do poems come from? I think they come from uh, the world around us and the world's in our heads. Let's go into the kitchen and see what's going on. Assemblage in February. At the end of the ridge, she cooks big meals for the living to share with the dead. She papers walls with unreal jungles and spreads herself beneath a confusion of stars. I am that shadow she made again and again with her camera. Like a protein, I appear in the sweat of her hands. I am a boy sleeping on her couch, my body floating in a bay. She is baking, she is waiting for the earth to turn us while the computers hum all night. Now they will never stop. She can do so much to save us in the light of the frozen waterfall, an inch of new snow upon the steps and railings. She is a song without shape in a town without bells, satellites winking above her destinations the oats of the earth stirred upon the stove. <laughs> Lauren was kind enough to quote from Dying in the Kitchen. I suppose I should read it. It's, uh, you know, it's about mortality, but I think it's kind of, uh, it has its, might have its amusing moments. I think collapsing in the kitchen would be a fine way to go. A pot of dumplings suspended upon the face, provided the kids are grown and employed. <laughs> and Laura is at the museum among the expressionists, and that the children have forgiven me, and that Laura and I have made love in the morning, and that the cats were fed, and the overloaded washer not banging like a mad drum without a drummer in the trembling webs of the basement. I don't want to die in a racket of machines or humans. There's been enough of that. I want to expire in a rare privacy without the strange blind companionship of a voice on the radio. My two favorite heroes entered eternity through the noble quiet of the kitchen. Grandma Ruth, in her morning ritual of Raleigh cigarettes, solitaire, and coffee, and the fine poet, William Stafford, who was making an apple pie when he fell. Great God of kitchens, let the dog be near to lick my face clean. And might you perform the slight miracle of turning off the burner and the light above the sink before we go. Yes, we can all laugh at an annihilation camp. Wallace Stevens, my, my mentor and one of my heroes, some of whom are here tonight, uh, Dr. Bert Carlson introduced me to a poet named Wallace Stevens who said, um, he said a lot of complicated things, but one thing he said that was very simple and memorable was that uh, he believed that uh, poetry, the purpose of poetry is to help people live their lives. And I rather like that notion. The purpose of poetry is to help people live their lives. 
I think its purpose is also to gather people together so they can drink beer and talk. I think that's a good purpose too. But to help people live their lives, good. Let's move on to uh, another volume here. Um, these poems are from the Island Blade. I have the good fortune of being married to a, a, a gifted artist and writer herself. We share studio space, and uh, writing around a painter is really exciting. There's all sorts of color and smells and sounds, and it's very exciting to, to have her work around me as I write. And I think this piece comes out of that experience. It's called From the Face of a Painter's Hour. Something purple bled from the face into a basin for my dirty hands. In the knowing of this thing that cannot be dispersed, this haunted thing so endlessly hurt in the circle of itself, something purple dripped from the brush, this timid and self-pitying and self-hating breather of itself in a pulse always ready to be quickened, how might I hold it long enough? I was happy walking toward heaven behind my father, happy to be pulled under water by God. How well the rocks of heaven held the sleeping children, how carefully we stepped on our way to the sleeping place. With purple feet small in the dark sand, little eyes, so many in the dark wind, Two violinists came to watch the choosing, though how can we know what is painted or not painted upon us? So I wonder if you have a tree in your brain. Is there a tree you carry around? If you're lucky, you probably do. It's probably a magical, powerful tree I have one. It's a tall pine tree. We used to climb it. It gets sap on our hands when I was little. So this uh, tall pine tree shows up occasionally. One, one time while I was scribbling, it showed up and I realized it was more than a pine tree. That it was attached to other things as well. This piece is called Climbing the Tallest Pine. The wind smells of clay across the surface of a thought. If you endure, wait for nothing. The memorized trees could not remain. It becomes only more difficult to create a name and hold pictures in your hand, difficult to recite the facts, to stay situated in the great dust, to call oneself, to race the leaves and cry in a wide breath for the first books you loved in a function you could keep whole. Where the baby vomited, where a prayer began, it's difficult climbing the tallest pine, searching for an art that wants to be an art, not a conjunction nor a prize. Only an empty altar, made without mercy, visited without mercy. One of the nice things about being married to a really good painter is you get to go places and hang the paintings up and watch people look at them and, and go to receptions. So. Uh, Laura showed her work in Florence, Italy a few years ago at the uh, Florence Biennale. And I got to go along to help. And uh, this piece was written after we got back. Can you imagine? Well, you've, you've made journeys before. When you come back from the journey, things change sometimes. Sometimes uh, in good ways, sometimes not. 
But I felt different after having gone to Florence and walked in the footsteps of Michelangelo and Dante and all sorts of incredible people. After Florence, after Florence, we began to learn again. Our jobs became a bit meaningless. We felt more comfortable in our intoxications, in the stain of the rose we were trying not to eat. What to do with enlightenment and no ambition? It was a giant who chased us out of our minds, out of his mind. I had to hold your hand five miles above the earth, a wide fire burning across central Florida, the dark ribbons of smoke woven in that memory of an island by death and its chattering. After Florence, we began to understand the abstract nature of prayers, exoskeletons blown into space. Soon, ancient children were appearing unannounced at dinner with baskets of fruit and bouquets of vapor, bottles of undiscovered wine, and loaves of impossible bread. I played the cornet when I was a boy. And one day I was scribbling and the cornet showed up. I didn't plan it. I didn't expect it. But there it was. What do we do with the stuff that shows up in our head? There's all sorts of things you can do, aren't there? Some of them healthy, some of them not so healthy. But I think the artist realizes that he or she has to do something with the, those materials. I don't know, maybe forgetting about them is the best thing. Maybe not. But this cornet, cornet would not go away, so here it is, the cornet. This will become another page of dust in a wet eye, dreaming of healing and rowing winter canals. In words no one will see, I am disturbed naturally by everything I think is happening. The Senate of my country should know me, my historic psyche in my hands. In my own dust I stop my direction and call the names of my daughters and renounce all solutions. I think of human slavery and forget how to pray. I look upon my blank hands in the space where they disappeared. And I want to hold my old cornet and arrive where no one will know me. I don't want to think of my mother in circus music. I want to dance in my bare feet as the sun comes inward and descends in the words I make. I'd like to read maybe one or two from my chapbook, Wanting to Be an Element, and then, uh, then close with a, a poem about autumn and other things. Wanting to be an element, released into the red and white wind, we laughed beneath the flags in a Canadian dream. I sit here in a daze of cities, a boyhood tundra, carrying my dented instruments into the future. Soon my wife will drive me to town, to that place where I can wait in the sun, just making lines for no one, though everyone wants to know what we should be doing. A rock placed upon a bare table gives us ample ways to think about ourselves, Mars, or a party on the other side of town. A rock, an element 
through which we might change the terrain of memory, the eyes at a funeral, the mouths at a funeral. I am an entertainer and I don't want to be. I want to look at myself, washing myself, so my children would understand why I kept making words. Here's a poem I wish was not so relevant, but it runs parallel to everything on the TV right now. Um, so I felt it had to be written. It's called Essay in a Time of War. Dear, I've driven to town and pulled money from my back pocket the nation is still at war. The solitary walkers still wobble at the edge of the highway gathering cans. I want to know my own difficulty. You rise from the tub in the pastels of the candle. How can I tell you a story of death? Perhaps there are things we should not think about, but who can stop the brain? You and your viable warmth could save the world. Now I know a river does not divide anything. As soon as words serve our will, they seem to die. Our poor army is in flight, though no one can see it. I pulled money from my back pocket in a haze of what we know. I drove to town without a motive, just an obligation. I saw it all burning and the drums kept coming into my head. I thought I would explode in a rainy ditch. The price of gas across the river is cheaper. No one can explain why. Let me close with this poem. Um, I think all of those uh, wonderful observations that uh, uh, Lauren made, I think they come to the surface in this work. I think this poem wants to be lyrical. I think it wants to be music. I uh, also think it wants to explore our kind of ontological uh, emergencies and this fancy way of saying our human condition. Yeah. I hope you enjoy it. Um, I've very much appreciated the beautiful and centered con concentration that I felt from you tonight. Essay on Autumn Light. The tongue is a smudge in the mouth and yellow leaves are blown all around the names of towns and people's heads. We want to move our arms through the last breath of the yellow leaves. Take my frozen hand and make me come out of my gender. It is so heavy in my name. Such an indigo light bleeding the language of the cosmos leaf to leaf from the zodiac to the periodic table. Choose a map, it does not matter. We are sucked upon lovers walking toward the winter clarity, watching the portrait we made of each other, touching the deep insults of time we carried, filling with planet light and yellow leaves blown translucent upon our arms and faces, walking the autumn mud of the south, soon it will freeze in bodies that cannot sleep apart or face to face. In a syntax of sunset, we paint and remake the hills into their nothingness. Choose a song, it does not matter.
The winter creatures obey the fiery carbons in their brain. We have moved our arms into yellow leaves from stasis to ecstasy to stasis. The wind made still in its brooding. The light made softer in its thievery. Angles of yellow held in the groaning of the bare tree limbs. The pain of the air tasting of the riven body. The hunger of the lungs and the words of the last cries. In sick waves of light, faces reshaped in tenebrism and sucked back into some renaissance we have never known. How we are destroyed so light might never end. And desire returned to give the elements back their silence and give the purple hills their purple knowing, the faceless, mindless vision made whole. Thank you so much. Um, thank you guys for coming so much. A quick announcement, the next Potent Residence reading series will be with Lucia Orth, who is a novelist and a lawyer and a wonderful human being, and that will be on October 28th, so please mark your calendars. Um, George will answer any questions you have at this time, and he will also be in the back signing books. So um, Q&A, anybody have questions for our reader? Was your best shot. <laughs> Maybe we could chat, uh, and if not, he will be available for more intimate questioning. Thank you so much for coming.